singing majesty majesty forever i am changed by your love in the presence of your majesty one more time Singing majesty, hallelujah, majesty. glory, oh hallelujah, grace is found me just as oh, I hallelujah. am, empty handed but alive in your hand, forever, one more time. Singing majesty, majesty, forever I am changed by your love. In the presence of your majesty, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, today I ask that as this word is preached, that you would touch hearts and change lives. And God, for this, we'll be careful to praise you and to give honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated today. Today I'm going to continue on in our series Today I'm going to be preaching on prayer and fasting. We're going to look at some areas that perhaps in the past we have overlooked. And Tony or whoever's running sound will need to adjust me a little bit. And how many of you, if I were just to, I'm going to just ask a couple of questions first. How many of you want to be free? How many of you know that God loves you? And how many of you would like to keep from having to go to the Lord for the same thing over and over and over and over and over again? I, am, I agree. So, today I want to help us find how to get there. So, if you're struggling, if you will lay down your phones, if you will turn them off, put them on silent, and not have to deal with anybody or any Facebook junk, until after I've finished, you might learn something. <laughs> That'll help you. Uh, sometimes we get our minds so involved with other things that we can't hear the thing we need to hear. And let me tell you, that's a ploy and the trick of the enemy. He don't want you to hear what you need to hear. There are those today in the church who do not believe that fasting is necessary. And for those, I have a question. Actually, two questions. First question is, do we still have to deal with the devil today? And has he still, does he still have the power that he used to have? Well, then I think we might ought to fast. Because some things are not leaving unless you do. Can you hear me? Satan was on the end, receiving end of Matthew 17, 14 through 21. Let's look at that. And when the multitude, and when they had come to him, come, let's, let me start that over. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. First question I have, were they not preachers? Were they not laying hands on the sick and them recovering? Were they not casting out demons? Then why can they get this one? Things to ponder. I'm going to help us get there. Sometimes we pray about a lot of things and don't get victory. I've been in that position 
where I prayed and prayed and prayed and thought I had it, but I didn't have it. <laughs> then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Next verses. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. What was the difference between the disciples and Jesus? Forty days. Forty days in the wilderness was the difference at that point. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately when they got all by themselves and said, Why couldn't we cast it out? So Jesus answered them, Because of your unbelief. Now they did believe. For assuredly I say to you, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, Move here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However... This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. I know that fasting, when you mention the word fasting, people begin to think all kinds of things. I'm going to starve and all of that's going to happen. No, you won't starve. When Jesus said this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting, he was likely referring to the type of spirit that it was. As some spirits have stronger authority and more and are more wicked than others. Let me prove that in the scripture. Luke 11, 24 and 26. 24 through 26. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from whence I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits. Read the rest of that statement. So some spirits are more wicked. Some things take more power. Some things won't leave just when you pray. Sometimes you've got to add some fasting to it. We don't like to hear that because that's an ancient practice. And when we think of fasting, we think all kind of negative stuff. Let me tell you, the devil, if I was the devil, two things I would get out of the body of Christ. I can tell you right now, I'd get the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. And I would get that fasting thing out of there. Because I'm telling you, prayer and fasting, when you add fasting, you make your prayer become supernatural. And it will begin to do the impossible. It will make the impossible things possible. And the devil knows that. He does not want the church to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And there's a host of them that preach against it. And there's a host of them that say fasting is not necessary. Let me tell you, that's just what the adversary wants. He wants you to believe that you don't need the Holy Ghost. And he wants you to believe you don't ever have to fast. But when you run upon a spirit that's more strong than the other. And you can't deal with it. And you pray about an issue over and over and over. And nothing happens. It's time for plan B. Because plan A is not getting it done. So you've got to add fasting. That's what Jesus told them. This kind's not leaving. And he told them why. And Luke, this kind is not leaving because it go, it's seven times better, worse. It goes and gets company. It goes and finds demons that's more powerful and more, what the Bible said, more wicked than it is. I know it's hard to believe they're all wicked and they're all going to be in hell, but some are more wicked than others. Isn't that crazy? I didn't write the book. I'm just preaching it. Let me tell you, the devil's done a pretty good job of removing both of those things from the church. The devil knows the power that lies in prayer and fasting. He knows that prayer and fasting is the master key to the impossible. If he can stop you, you'll never do the impossible thing. He wants to keep you especially from fasting. Fasting supercharges our prayer. Some things in life just won't leave without it. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been praying for something for a long time and it just... And you've had everybody in the country anoint you with oil. You've been to every prayer meeting. I mean, my Lord, you're almost in a prayer meeting every, every night and somebody's praying with you for the same problem. That you got the victory on Tuesday, but you lost it on Wednesday. You got it on Wednesday, but you don't have it on Friday over the same issues. Been there, done that, don't like it. You know, I'm a person that when something ain't working, I got to find what's going to work. 
And I've proven, and I'm going to prove to you today, and I'm going to give you homework, so you might as well get your book out and write these stuff down. I can't preach all of this in 45 minutes. You're going to have to do homework on your own. Some things in life are not leaving. You can pray, walk up and down, and talk in tongues until you're blue in the face. But let me tell you, when you do that, and you add that supercharge of fasting, let me tell you, it doesn't matter how bad the Spirit is, eventually it's going to have to let go and go, because Jesus Christ said so in Matthew. This kind don't leave except, but when except is met, he will leave. Think about it in your own life. What needs to leave that has not left yet? Some of you live in bondage over the same stuff again and again. Add some fasting to it and break it and be done with it. You know, when you live that way, here's what, here's what the enemy does. Here's what he makes you think. Listen to me. He makes you think that your prayers won't work. I guess it's not God's will to heal me. What does the revealed word of God say about that? You know what the revealed word is, right? The Bible. That's, the, that's what we have tangible, we can hold. What does the Bible say about your healing? You answer that question, you'll find God's will. If you can answer the question, you'll find God's will about your sickness. Unless it is a sickness unto death, and I don't think there's that. If there's a sickness unto death, you're pretty gone. You're gone pretty quick. Let me tell you, the right kind... Catch a hold of those words, right kind. We're going to talk about right kind and wrong kind in a little while. The right kind of prayer and fasting will bring results. One of the most common ways people's faith is weakened is by assuming it is not God's will to answer their prayers. I often hear, hear I've been praying and praying about it and nothing happens. Then add fasting. I guess this is my thorn in the flesh to carry. Are you Paul? I can't find nobody in the Bible except Paul that had that. Are you that arrogant that God has to do that to you? You know, he got that because he was an arrogant, puffed up rascal. And he had to carry that. Are you him? I just accept it. I don't accept stuff like that. It's not so, I'm not supposed to. Sometimes people ask for the things. That's not God's will. And I understand that. But many things ask are in harmony with the revealed word of God. In other words, if you can read it in the Bible as the will of God, it's all right to pray and fast for it. And God will honor that. For example... It is God's will for the sick to be healed. He reveals it throughout His revealed Word. It is the will of God that Christians live in good health. It is the will of God that believers have victory over oppression, depression, and fear. Why in the world would God save me and say, Your thorn is in the flesh is you're going to be oppressed and depressed and feel fear the rest of your life. Now that's a joyful Christian and you're probably going to win a lot of souls. Kick down a lot of doors when you're depressed and oppressed and full of fear. It is God's will, but sometimes it's difficult for us to accept God's expressed or revealed will because we don't know it. We think I'm a special case. We're not special cases. It's universal for everybody. Universal for everybody. It is universal. It is God's will that those in the body of Christ experience joy. The joy of the Lord in their hearts. It is the will of God that you prosper and be in health just as your soul prospers. 3 John 2. Let's look at this. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now think about that statement for a moment. So God wants me to be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and sick. Depressed. Oppressed. Does that even make sense? I mean, logically that don't make sense to me. But spiritually it cannot be so. Sometimes we begin to believe things that are not true. And if you believe something that's not true long enough, what does it become? It becomes a truth. That's what the Bible says. Let them believe a lie and be damned. If you believe that you're going to have to carry this for the rest of your life, so be it. 
God will let you. He don't want you to. You guys, am I preaching all right? Y'all going to take me out for, for snacks afterwards, have cookies with me? Prayer is an essential part of the daily life. And sometimes we have to add fasting to get the problem solved. Think about it. Adam and Eve's disobedience by doing what? Eating the forbidden fruit was the original cause of man's losing his God-given dominion in the Garden of Eden. Christ made possible the restoration of man's dominion by fasting 40 days and nights in the wilderness and overcoming the attacks of the enemy. What was one of the attacks of the enemy? Eve said, when I saw in Genesis that the fruit was good to look at and good for food. In other words, it got her eyes lusting after that. Thing. Man, that is the prettiest fruit I've ever seen. Had a hundred trees in there, a thousand trees. It was a thousand miles square. Who knows how many trees was in the garden? A lot of fruit in there, but that one just looks so... You know why? Because it, they were told not to. And sometimes in our lives, we, want to, we gravitate to what God has told us to stay away from. Paul explains that the things I would do, I do not do. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, there I am doing them. We go to that place a lot. And we don't have to. Adam and Eve were given the garden as a home with instructions. Stay out of that. Genesis 3, 6. Christ the second Adam refused to give in to the temptation to do what? Create bread and eat. Our appetites and our lusts and can sure get us in trouble. When we look at and gravitate toward the wrong things. Lack of discipline over the appetites or the desires of the flesh led to spiritual ruin. Let's look at it. In Genesis chapter 25, 31 through 33. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. Esau came in out of the field hunting. And he hadn't eaten since breakfast. And he says, if I don't get something to eat, I'm going to die. You know you can go 40 days without touching a bite of food and not die, right? Yeah. You got to drink some water, but you can go 40 days. He couldn't go 40 minutes. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Do you know what he was giving up as the firstborn? He was giving up a lot. Then Jacob says, swear to me this day. So he swore to him and sold him his birthright, and he sat down and ate a bowl of soup. And when it come time to get a blessing, he thought so little of his relationship, or he thought so little of his birthright, and sometimes we think so little of our relationship with God. Oh, God will forgive me. Esau ran in there to his daddy and said, Do you have a... And, and well, you know all the story. I don't have time to preach it all. But anyway, Jacob went in, had skin on him, and he got the blessing. And Esau went in and said, Do you have nothing for me? He said, Sorry, they're all gone. You're just up a creek, bud. By gratifying his fleshly appetite that day, Esau forfeited the glory that would have been his. When he became remorseful, he was sad for his act. He did not repent. He became angry. For four, and for 20-some years, he was, he was hoping to kill Jacob. We know the story. They met. A lot of things happened. I don't have time to preach that either. But over and over in the Scripture, we find people losing their place with God through failure to control the desires of the flesh. How many homes have been destroyed because of the desires of the flesh? Watching pornography, having affairs. How many lives have been destroyed by that? But also we find examples of others through the Bible, through the discipline of fasting, overcome obstacles and obtain answers from God that change the destiny of kingdoms. By lusting for the delicacies of Egypt, the Israelites lost the blessing of God. Psalms 106, 14 through 15. 15. But lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert, and he gave them their request. But, you think God won't let you have your request? You think God won't let you go on down that road? But this is what's going to happen when you do. But sent leanness into their soul. They were still Israelites. But there was leanness in their relationship with God Almighty. Hmm.
I don't want to be in that place to you. We need to understand that desiring and pursuing what is not the will of God leads to dire consequences. When we insist on satisfying our own selfish desires, God sometimes lets us have our way. But it comes with physical lean, uh, spiritual leanness and sometimes physical calamities. We suffer in the body. God may let us pursue things contrary to the revealed word of God. In other words, it's out of the will of God. Things like unholy relationships, worldly pleasures, ungodly fellowship with unbelievers. But in the end, these things are destructive and and have harsh consequences. Israel's lust for Egypt brought spiritual leanness and physical sickness. Moses, however, by his prayer and fasting for 40 days, saved them from complete destruction. Look at Exodus 32, 32 through 35. God was getting ready to kill them all dead. And raise up another nation from Moses. He said, I'll just wipe them out and I'll build a nation from you. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray you blot me out of your book which you have written. And there's a man of God right there. He said, just, if you won't save my, if you won't save the people. You know, I don't have time to preach the lengthy conversation he had with God about, hey, you know, you brought them out here and if they die... Dot, dot, dot. He's going to think, uh, who, they're gonna, people are going to say that couldn't God take care of them. But I'm talking about what Moses did. Moses fasted for 40 days. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. In other words, and if you read the story, he did get rid of some of them. He walked through and began to just get rid of some of them. I don't want to be got rid of, do you? Now, therefore, go lead the people to the place which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. They wanted a calf. He said, have a calf. Have a cow, I guess. But guess what? It comes with a price. It comes with a price. Those living in Noah's day were bent on satisfying their physical lusts and desires until they were unaware that the gathering clouds were coming before it was too late. Now look at Matthew 24, 37 through 38, what the Bible tells us. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. When Jesus gets ready to come, go back and study what they were doing in Noah's day. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and having seances and having orgies. Sounds like 21st century America or 21st century world. Wild and riotous parties. Well, the Bible says that. Before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Christ warned his disciples not to be like those people. Need to be careful. Need to be very cautious about how we live as Christian men and women. Fasting will win battles and put the enemy to flight even if there have been failures in the past. The enemy sometimes tells us because you have failed and you've messed up, God won't honor you, but he'll honor somebody else. That's not true. That's a trick of the enemy that the enemy definitely wants you to believe. But that is not true, absolutely not true at all. Judges 20, 20 through 28. Defeat was turned to victory. You know what? Um, I'm going to let you guys read that on your own. I'll tell you the story briefly. Israel had went out to battle. They were not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. They lost... uh, 22,000 one day, or 20,000 one day, and 18,000 the next day. And they called the people together, and they had a 24-hour fast, and they went out the next day, and they won the battle. So defeat was turned into victory by simply praying and fasting. They had prayed and talked to the Lord, but when they added fasting, they went out the next day, and they won. Jonah warned the people of Nineveh that in 40 days their city would be destroyed. The king and the people received that warning, put on sackcloth. The Bible even says that the king got off of his throne, took off his robe and put on sackcloth and a city of a population of 160,000 were saved. 
They put on sackcloth and ashes and fasted, and God spared the city. Most time, people just preach about Jonah getting mad about it. But I want you to see the other story. The people in that city, when they heard that it was going to be a calamity on them, they all prayed and they fasted and they sought the Lord. I don't know exactly how many days they did that, but the city was spared and 160,000 people were saved. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying if you've got a family member, I believe God can save your family. I believe God can de deliver your family if, if your family's wrapped up in things that are not pleasing to God. I believe that God can set them free if you'll add that second, that second element to your prayer. In a minute, I'm going to talk to us about right praying or right fasting. You know, I've preached about pray, right praying because sometimes we think that we can just go to God and He's a genie in a bottle. He's not a genie in a bottle, folks. I don't care how much oil is smeared on you and how much of stuff you do. He's not a genie in a bottle. He has, a, he has things out laid in Scripture for us. Homework for you. Read Gen uh, Jonah chapter 3. The whole chapter. Just read it and you'll get the story. I don't have time to preach it. Esther spared the Jewish people by her prayer. Read the book of Esther. More homework. This week read Jonah and Esther. Read the third chapter of Jonah and read the book of Esther. The Bible examples are many on the victories that prayer coupled with fasting won. Quickly, let me tell you the three kind of fasts in the Bible. There's a normal fast. No food, just water. The absolute fast, no food and no water, three days in duration. The partial fast or the Daniel fast found in the book of Daniel when he ate only certain types of food and eliminated any cakes and desserts and pleasant food. In other words, he lived on fruits and vegetables for the 21 days. And sometimes that will be good for us. And starting in January the 6th through the 26th, this local church will be in a 21 day of prayer and fasting. Well, there is the other type of fasting. That's the supernatural fast where Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible said he had no food and no water. So that was a supernatural. Now, for just a minute, I want to talk about right and wrong fasting. Right way and a wrong way to fast. There is a right way to fast and a wrong way to fast. Great results can be obtained through prayer and fasting. But it is possible to fast in a way that does more harm than good. You know, we're such good people that we like to think that anything we do is perfect in all of its ways. And that if I simply pray and fast, God is obligated to answer me. Not if I pray with wrong motives and a wrong heart. Not if I fast with wrong motives and wrong heart. He's not obligated to do anything. One thing, fasting should be done as much as possible in secret. Now, it's impossible if you are married or... Uh, you know, have a family. Your family's going to know when you're fasting. Um, I freaked my boss out one time. He went on vacation for two weeks, and the day he left, I started a 14-day fast. When he come back, when he opened the door, he thought I was sick. He said, he just come unglued on me. He thought I need to go to the doctor. <laughs> I lost 28 pounds. He thought something had happened to me. Two weeks ago, you were this size, and now you're this size. He come unglued. The right method of fasting is as important, because, and Christ called attention to that. Let's look at Matthew 17, 20, and 21. In his first lesson on fasting. Do you have that, Tony? If, if not, I got it. Matthew 17, 20, 21, yeah. Then Jesus answered and said, oh, that must be a different scripture that I want. Matthew 6, I'm sorry, Matthew 6, 16 through 18, I'm sorry. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. Don't make it a point to tell everybody you're fasting. Don't go around looking like you've been pickled in pickle juice. The Bible says get up and anoint your head. You know what that means? It doesn't mean pour a bottle of oil on your head before you go out the door. It means get up, take a shower, wash your face, comb your hair and brush your teeth and go to work. Ready. And do, and just fast, and just pray, and just talk to God. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. And surely I say to you, they have their reward. That's it. You get zero. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, there are times when you call a corporate fast, and I showed you those all in the Bible when Israel fasted and when Esther and Mordecai and all those guys fasted and all the Jewish people there with her. They all fasted and sought the Lord, and God honored them. It is, it is vain to fast to receive honor of men. 
God has a place for each member of his body of believers. And when we seek to fulfill that place that God wants us, we will find true happiness. It is wrong to seek, to fast, to seek power merely to gratify human ambition. Let me tell you something. If God uses you with a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, don't let anybody start lauding you with, with, oh, you walk on water. Because I'm telling you, that's the enemy trying to set you up. You realize God used a donkey, right, to talk to a man? Think about that when you're you're puffing yourself up a little bit. God used a donkey. God used a stick. Moses' staff. Think about all of those things that he used. You ain't all that good. All you are is a hunk hunk of dirt that he breathed into and made live. That's all we are. Anything we do under any kind of anointing is God. When we let people puff us up or we get puffed up ourselves, we're headed for trouble. And then God begins to dishonor, uh, to uh, uh, disqualify us when we pray and fast. That's why we pray and fast so many times and nothing happens because we're disqualified. For exaltation comes, listen to what the Bible says in, in Psalm 75, 6, and you don't have that, Tony. For exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. It comes from God alone, folks. Power comes from the Lord, my friend. To gain power with God, one's motives must be pure. That is to help other people, not for your own selfish glory. Fasting and selfishness do not mix. Isaiah 58, we read how fasting by religious people of Isaiah's day originated in selfishness. And that's not what God pleases. He won't receive that. Fasting is absolutely no benefit for those who are not walking in obedience to God. In other words, if you take this word of God and you're walking out of obedience to the word of God, your fasting is just dieting. You're not going to get anything. It's just dieting. So it's necessary for us before we fast to go and prepare ourselves and begin to ask the Lord to examine us to see if there's any wicked way in us. Paul did that often. He said, Lord, look into my heart, look into my mind, look into my thoughts, look into all of those things. And then prepare yourself to go fast. Because you can get frustrated praying and fasting and going, you know, this stuff just doesn't work. I don't care what that preacher says. And I've read it in the Bible, but it still ain't working. But if we're doing it from a wrong perspective and a wrong motive, it's not going to work. It is of absolute no value. Let's look at Jeremiah 14, 10 through 20. Now I'll get ready to close with this. Thus says the Lord to this people, Thus they have loved to wander. In other words... We don't keep our minds on the Lord. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sins. Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for this people, for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings, that's prayer and grain offerings, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword of the famine by the famine, and by the pestilence. Pretty interesting stuff. Then I said, O Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine. That's the yea, yea, thus, thus saith the Lord guy. Nothing wrong with giving a word of wisdom. I believe in that. I believe in a word of wisdom and I believe in all those things, all the gifts of the Spirit. But I'm telling you, if, 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 you're getting a, if you're getting a word and you ain't living right, I'd be very cautious. You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And the Lord said to, to me, the prophet prophesies lies in my name. That ain't true. I'm not going to do it. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing and the deceit of their heart. I am super cautious myself about giving words. I am very super cautious. I know this is kind of heavy. 
But we just need to understand. Look, I want, when you pray and fast, I want you to get what God wants you to have. And just like when I want you to take communion, I want you to, to um, take, an, take a minute um, to talk to the Lord and to find out what's inside of you before you take that communion. So by the same token, I want you to think what's inside of you before you go to the Lord in prayer and fasting. If you're mad and you're angry and you're upset and you're at ill sorts with people, you need to work that out. Well, I don't want to. I know. I don't want to either sometimes. But it's necessary. And then you go to the Lord in fasting and He'll hear you. Then when you get a word, it's a true word. <clears throat> And it's the right word, and it's a word that helps you. It's a word that edifies you. Listen, if you get a word that God's going to bless you and He doesn't bless you, that's not God. Somebody just told you in the flesh. Why would God tell you He's going to do something and then not do it? Is He a liar? No. I have been in meetings where someone wanted to tell somebody so bad that they were going to be blessed because they felt so sorry for them, they would just tell them, you're going to be blessed. Didn't hear it from God, but because they just, they just wanted it so much for that person. Don't do that. Don't do that to a person. Ooh, Lord, somebody help me. Give me some music up here. Fasting is a master key which causes the impossible to become possible. But humility, repentance, and sincerity of heart are the keys to the type of fasting that God recognizes and accepts. Would you stand with me today? Don't worry, I'll be off doctrine here for long. I'll be preaching something else. But church, I'm concerned about the church in America. I'm concerned that we're just taking wrong turns and going in places that's going to get us in trouble. I see so much of the power being stripped away from the church. When I look back to when my grandma was going to church and my mama, my goodness, when I look back there, my wife's grandmother was was the beneficiary of a supernatural miracle. But her and her husband were praying and fasting people. And this is what happened to her. They went from island to island in the Philippines and they were starting churches. They were on a ship in the ocean getting ready to go from the ship to a small boat. And there was a storm that was raging. And the boat was going like this. You know, they were separating. She was trying to get in the boat. The boat was going like this. And Grandpa had got in the boat, but the boat was going like this. And she couldn't swim. And when she started to get in the boat, well, she missed the other boat, went down in the water in a storm. When she went in the water, the storm was raging, and God stopped it. He made the sea become like glass. She went down in the water and she popped up like a cork and they grabbed her and put her back in the, put her in the little boat and the storm started again. You think miracles only happen in the Bible in some weird place? Look, it's happened in families in this church. I can tell you story after story of people I know where miracles have happened. Because God is a sovereign God. Gordon Lindsay's son, Dennis, was riding a motorcycle. Got in a super bad accident. Hit somebody hit him, flipped him over, landed about 30 feet away. The very moment that he was getting in that accident, his daddy, Gordon Lindsay, was on his knees praying for his son. When they took him to the hospital, he should have been dead. He was on a motorcycle. You understand? On a motorcycle, getting get at a high rate of speed, getting hit by a car. He just had one little scratch on him. The other person, not so lucky. That's the sovereignty of God. 
Dennis tells a story that when he got home, his daddy was still praying. You guys know who Gordon Menzies is, right? No? Okay, well, anyway. Uh, he's a great guy. He was a great guy. He's passed away now. I could tell you stories all, all, the, all day about the supernatural working of God. But I want you to experience that. I don't want to just tell you the story. I want you to, to let the story be a part of, to be your story. I have my stories. My wife can tell stories about me when the Lord made me fly through the air and land in a place that I, there was, it's impossible for me to land, but I just flew through the air and landed. It was impossible. I, I don't know anything about it. God is sovereign. I want that to be your story. I want that to be your story to tell your kids the supernaturalness of God, the way that He works. When I pray and fast, I want to get results. I want to get answers. And I'm just like you. I have to go to the Lord and, and work out things in my heart that are not what, what they ought to be. Just like Paul did. I'm no exception because I, I preach. I'm no exception because I'm in the Word every day and, and all of that. I'm no exception. I have, to, I have to. I'm just like all of you. There's things I have to work out. Things that, that, are, that are weaknesses in my life. I have to work those things out just like you do. Go to the Lord with them. When you get ready to pray and fast, go to the Lord and tell the Lord, Lord, here am I. Do like David. Search me, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. And if you find out there is, then do what David did. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. David knew how to get it done. We got to get it done. This is business here. It's real business, serious business, eternal business, heaven and hell business, your family hanging in a balance business, you hanging in a balance business. We need God's help. If you're here today and you haven't accepted Christ as your personal Savior and you want to make a decision to serve Him, to change your life and to start walking with Him, would you put your hand up? Anybody in this building today? You want to change your life. You're tired of the old way you've been living. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful today for your magnificent goodness and your grace that extends forever into all generations. Lord, I'm so thankful and I'm so grateful to you, Lord. I love you with everything that is in me. I praise you, Almighty King, and I honor you today. And I ask you, Lord, that these stories that I preach today from your word God, that we can take those and that we can apply them to our lives. Lord, I pray that this would cause us to have introspection. And Lord, we would look internally into our own selves. Instead of looking outwardly to everything else and everybody else, we would look at us. We would ask you to help us, to cleanse us, to minister to us, to speak to us, to make things right in us, God. Lord, and I'll be careful to praise you and give honor to you. Lord, I love you today and I praise you today. I call upon your name for this body of people, body of believers here. Minister your strength in their life, Father. I plead the blood of Jesus over each one of them that's here today. I plead your blood over them. In Jesus' name.